Welcome everybody to the Florence Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, where we strive to keep our doors open, period. Um, my name is Sally Watts, and it's my pleasure to be your service leader. We start our program by offering our acknowledgement that we stand today on the traditional land of the first people of Florence, the Sayusla Indians. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the members of the Sayusla tribe, past, present, and future. We open our service with Spirit of Life. We've got two of you with us today. He's going to lead us through this, and uh, I turn it over to you, Mr. Tuvia. Spirit of Life, come unto me.
I just want to remind everyone um, that the labyrinth for the summer solstice mm -hmm. is on June 19th at 11 o'clock. I'm going to assist Rosemary and we're going to welcome in the longest day of the year, yes. the summer beginning. Yes. Hope to see you all there. It's at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in the back at the labyrinth. Welcome all. I love walking that labyrinth. It's very, very, very special. So I invite two of you to come forward. He's going to help us light the flame here in this fellowship. Maybe you want to light a candle where you are. This is called Exploring Who We Are by Melanie Davis. Go right ahead, two of you. Under the right circumstances, playing with fire is a delight. Imagine being gathered around a fire pit as the crackling flames invite us to sing and dance and roast a marshmallow or two. Our chalice also invites us to play, although with ideas rather than with marshmallows. The flame encourages us to explore who we are, who our neighbors are, and where we are on our spiritual journeys. Today we light this chalice in the spirit of play. Let us trust the light to guide us in this hour and in the days to come finding joy along the way. That's beautiful. This goes with our theme, which is play, and uh, goes nicely with Ruth's message today. At this time, I invite Catherine to come forward. We've got our joys and concerns. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is the part of our service where we tell and share our joys and concerns. This allows us and reminds us how we are all connected. I mean deeply, personally, lovingly. The first, I have a wonderful joy. Lori Severance got married. Yes! yes. We wish her all the joy, comfort, and excitement that a relationship can offer, especially when we choose to enter one later in life. <laughs> Love and hope spring eternal. Yes! <laughs> yes! Congratulations. Lori, and Lori and Ray. And Lori and Ray. Lori and Ray. Congratulations. Um, my next is a concern. Uh, Anne Lathrop's partner, David Morrison, is going through a series of health concerns. At the moment, he is in Riverbend Hospital, hospital recovering from surgery. Anne's liaison for communication is Deborah Larson right now because she is herself focusing all her energy uh, on David and his recovery. So right now she doesn't really want all these phone calls, but she, she knows we are with her and we are praying for her, meditating for her, intending for her in our Power of Eight group, everything we can do. So Michelle? Absolutely. A couple. This is for Anne and this is for David. Our thoughts are with you. And I don't know everything about uh, April and David Dumas's uh, journey down to Southern California. They went for David's brothers. I don't know if he passed or not. And then he, they came back and David was involved in a little fender bender. So I've reached out, but I haven't found have in communication, but let's put some Let's put some shelves in there. I'm going to give the, the, the special one for you, David. Absolutely. And uh, for your brother. So I had some musings on joys and concerns for our whole community. So if you'll bear with me. Someone said to me the other day, it seems so much harder to come out of this pandemic than to be in lockdown. Mm -hmm. Yes, lockdown. in lockdown, we seem to know the rules if we were following the science. The coming out includes the depth of feeling and change we went through in this past year. So coming out requires much compassion toward ourselves and others. On one hand, there's, some, there's fears and a desire to protect, and on the other hand, the relief and free-spiritedness of those who can't wait to embrace again. We don't have to buy into the fears or embrace the free spirit and spiritedness, but we would do well to open our hearts in support of each other as a spiritual community. Not 
of them and us, but a circle of acceptance. We are a loving community of diverse opinions. Love each other as we regroup and reconnect to the next glorious level of engagement. Blessed be. Oh, and that next level of engagement is going to consist of many things. We have, we have Ruth Miller, who's going to be leading some classes. We have Dean Schrock, who will be here and doing some classes and meditations. We have Donna Smith from Roseburg, who will be with us once a month. We don't know yet if she's going to do a class on Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon before the Sunday service. So we're creating, but uh, we are moving along, folks. So hang on. It's not going to be a bumpy ride. It's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> so um, at this time, I, I we're going to have a musical interlude from Jeff Lovejoy. He recorded this in May 2020, and it's entitled Glitters on Water. What I love about this is it just sparks this playfulness, this place of being. And as you listen to it, keep your heart open for all the joys and concerns that Catherine just expressed. And bring an element of play and curiosity to your life this day. Glitters on water. experience and and I've been playing there one of the ways I like to play is I like to make spaces beautiful 
And I've been playing here because, well, I now own this space here in Florence. And I have been slowly but steadily turning a pretty dirty, full space <laughs> into something that might be light-filled and hopefully will be a place where we can gather at least in small groups now and then. So I'm looking forward to that. Play. For me, that is a wonderful way to play. And we've used this word in so many interesting ways. Okay? We start out and we're expected to play. Was, you know, I remember growing up and mom would say, go play outside. And I'd look at her and I'd go, let's see, seven flights down the stairs, a concrete patio in, surrounded by 50-foot walls, or on the sidewalk of a busy intersection. What did you think I would play? <laughs> by myself? <laughs> For a little while, I figured out I got a slinky. Remember slinkies? Yeah. yeah. I had seven flights of stairs. <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to get that slinky to go down all of those flights. The tricky part is the corners. <laughs> you have to go from one flight to the next. But I got pretty far. I think I got three or four flights once. <laughs> Most of the time, my play was doing things, interestingly enough, I was, as I was putting this together, um, taking the coffee table and turning it into a house, uh, my playhouse, going under the, play under the coffee table. It was my playhouse. Or taking blocks and my toy trucks, I had toy cars and trucks, and turn that into a cityscape or a garage or something like that. So that was my idea of play. Hopscotch was boring. Jumping rope, ah, you can't do that by yourself very long. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that happened on the playground, I tried to participate in, but my performance issues got in there. <laughs> you know, when they bring up the board games on rainy days at school or after school, it's like, I got to learn how to do this, and then I got to figure out what's the right thing to do. And, and, and again, my performance issues would start coming up. It didn't feel like play, not to me. And so when my kids were growing up, board games weren't part of their life very much. Every now and then someone would pull something out. And now they are very much into board games, which is very interesting as adults with kids in their own. And I'm learning how to play board games now. <laughs> it's fascinating. The other thing that, that was going on, you know, as, as things evolved, is playing, you know, without much in the way of structure on the playground or wherever, turned into very structured playing games, right? We had to play athletic games and do it, you know, again, learn the rules and do it right, and someone had to win. What happened from play to play a game where winning was important? So I had a bit of a transition there, and I think all children do, making that shift. You know, we've, we've got kids in soccer practice very early now in this world. Um, it used to be it started in middle school, and now it's starting in preschool, right? <laughs> and fortunately, most preschool coaches know that this is not about winning. This is about learning to play with the ball and handle the ball and hang out together and do things as a group. Thank God. I have met one or two who didn't understand that, <laughs> unfortunately. But you know, then as they get older, it's more and more about what are you going to do to make the win happen, making the win happen, making the win happen, rather than about being on the field having a good time. So that's a transition that we put our children through and as I say, it's happening earlier and earlier in our culture. It used to happen along around middle school. You'd go from you know just you know the stickball game out in the street to the formal game on the you know in the diamond at some point. But now it's happening for much younger kids. So that shift from play is unformed exploration and interaction with the goal being having a good time, to structured interaction with the goal being winning the game, I think is a huge thing in our culture. 
And I think it's something to be aware of. Now, I, I didn't really understand the role of play, of course, until I studied psychology and social psychology and began to see you know, the developmental progress. That, and I looked, as an anthropologist, I looked at kids in various cultures, and what I saw was that typically what we call child play is kids practicing being adults. They're doing what adults do in their own way. Even cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians and all those games were what the kids saw on TV and on the radio adults do, right? They didn't see their parents do it, but they knew this was what adults do. So a lot of child play is pretending to be adults and literally exploring and developing those skills. The difference is in child play there is no intended outcome, ideally. There is no performance pressure. There is simply the exploration unbounded and unformed in many, many cultures. Now, outside of our culture, most children are no longer children once they pass puberty. As soon as they enter adolescence, they are no longer children, and child play doesn't happen. Uh, in, we see this in the Jewish tradition of bar mitzvah, and bat mitzvah at that point, at the early adolescent point. But that's a holdover from the ancient, ancient culture that just managed to carry through our current culture. In um, the Mayans, for example, a 12-year-old boy is expected to know how to build a house with his community's help and be, you know, to be assigned his wife uh, along about 12, 13, 14. By 14, he's an old, you know, he's, he's past that. <laughs> there are, now there are places for pubescent and adolescent young men to hang out until that happens. Uh, so somewhere between 10 and 15 you'll find a room, a building usually, which is just for them. They're no longer in the household with the girls and the parents. They are now learning how to be men in many, many of the other cultures at that stage in their life. And I think that has to do with how do we moderate testosterone? <laughs> how do we keep that testosterone focused for the good of the community and not get it caught up in selfishness? Those kids are not playing. Those kids are literally, intentionally practicing being adults. And they are being guided by elders who have been watching them since birth and are very much aware of what their gifts are and are encouraging their gifts. It's a very different point of view from ours. In ours we say, everyone has to know all of these things. Instead of going, oh, you're really good with mathematical spatial intelligence. Here, develop this gift. Oh, you're really good with interpersonal intelligence. Here, and develop this gift, and so on. There's, there's a wonderful book called Seven Kinds of Smart, which I often use when I'm teaching folks. And it really helps. <laughs> it really helps. And that notion that we all have individual and unique gifts provides a way that what people are channeled into doing doesn't feel like work. Now, in the last 50 years or so, maybe a little longer, this culture, particularly Americans, have attempted to make a very distinct line between work and play. When I'm working, it isn't fun. When I'm playing, it's fun. So people come up to me and they say, well, what do you do for fun? And I say, I live. <laughs> and my work is fun. And this is because some years ago, I figured out that if I follow my gifts and my spirit and my joy, then there is no distinction between work and play. Now, there are times when I have a performance pressure and times when I don't. And that's the only line that is. When I was a college professor, every now and then some other professor would stick their head in the door saying, you guys are having much too much fun. <laughs> and I'd go, yes! Because one of the other things I learned in psychology is we learn a lot better when we're laughing. 
So if I've created a space in which people are having enjoyment or are using that verb enjoy, <laughs> then more learning is happening. And this is what I'm here to do. Yes? So there's another set of ways we use this word play, and it happens in our culture about the same time we go into those structured games. For me, it was no longer playing in the childhood sense, but now I was to play an instrument with that time. The time that mom used to say, go outside and play, now she'd say, go sit down at the piano. <laughs> right? I was expected to practice an hour or more a day on a piano. That was just how it was. You can imagine what it was like getting a cabinet-style grand piano up those seven flights of stairs. <laughs> it was a big investment on her part, and that she made sure, as well as she was able, that it paid off. <laughs> But when we moved to California, we moved into suburbia, and she wasn't willing or able to pay to move the piano. So I got a guitar. <laughs> Much more mobile. <laughs> and played the guitar. Isn't that an interesting shift in the use of the word play? We go from child play to athletic and game board play to play an instrument. And for most kid, people, most kids, that is the progress, right? Well, many of us have continued to play some form of instrument. Some of us have continued to include play in our daily lives. Some of us have accepted what the culture says is play. You know, watch a football game, <laughs> that's play. Um, hang out at the bar, go dancing. Um, and then some of us have adopted four-legged four and feline and canine friends, and they play. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I got to do every now and then when I was in Texas is they have a hundred-pound Malamute, and I got to play. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That was fun when I could do that. My daughter's children have gone through this process. And it's been kind of interesting because I started taking care of kids in the 50s, and then I had kids in the 70s, and now my daughter has kids in this era. So I'm getting to watch all the ways these kids play and develop and all the expectations on them and all the different things that are given to them and they're expected to do during their growing up time. I, I was first uh, changing diapers when I was seven. So, I've been doing this a long time. And as I watched this, obviously the kids who grew up in the 50s, television was not the norm for them until the 60s. You know, most people didn't have a, phone, a television in their home until at least the mid-60s, and some of them the late 60s. So their idea of play was not media controlled. Later, they had the TV, but that was for entertainment, not for play. It was after they had played, and after they had eaten, then there would be television. And it was a different kind of thing. Radio was not heard in that house, in any of the houses that I was in, until, you know, and, uh, except for one on the farm. They did Saturday afternoon listening to the radio drama. That was cool. But everywhere else, it was, radio wasn't much of a deal. So this television thing would happen in the late afternoon or evening. It would be specific programs, very limited. And those of you who recall the 60s might remember there were three, maybe four networks. If you were lucky, you had public television, but probably not, right? So play for them was actors playing a role, another use of the word. We are playing a role. And one of the things that I enjoy is when I get to watch an actor playing the role of a professional athlete playing a game. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Costner likes those roles. <laughs> 
And there's a, one of my favorite lines is actually there's this point in um, one of his films where he's a baseball pitcher for love of the game, right? And he's pitching and he's pitching and it's about the eighth inning. <laughs> And his team is going, it's okay, you just throw the ball. And he's standing there and says, God, I promised you I'd never involve you in this game. But if you could just make my arm stop hurting, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the points that he makes in most of the films where he's playing an athlete, is it's a game. <laughs> Allow it to be a game. <laughs> so he's playing a role, I think maybe not too far from who he really is in these cases. <laughs> Playing a role of someone playing a game, and we see this a lot in the video, in the videos, in the various uh, forms of media that we get. Then there is the other form of playing a game, which is the social form. Some of you may recall there was a book that came out in the '70s, "The Games People Play." Right? I have used this over and over again. In my work and many of you who have been in my classes have heard we don't get to play the game ain't it awful here it is our number one conversational game in this country ain't it awful oh my goodness let me tell you about my problems oh yeah you have problems you should hear about my problems <laughs> right that kind of a thing and as someone who has been a minister in, in a variety of churches where positive thinking and speaking is the norm and the expected rule, I often have to remind people after the service that what they heard is still relevant and they don't have to play it at awful right now. <laughs> but it's for many people to see the only way they know how to connect with people is sharing what's wrong. So that's a game maybe we don't need to play anymore. What if, so what I asked my, the leaders in those congregations where that was happening to do is, if you happen to be in a group of people or sitting at the table where people are doing this, maybe if you could squeeze in a little question, isn't blank, figure out something wonderful. Just get that inserted in the conversation. What someone is wearing, what was said at the service, yeah, the weather, anything, <laughs> to see if we can go to ain't it wonderful <laughs> instead of ain't it awful. So th there's a variety of games that people play. That is our dominant one in this culture. And then there is this other thing. Carly Simon sings about it in a song when she says, players only love you when they play, when they're playing. You know, and players as a, as a concept out of Hollywood, which is interesting to me, where everyone is playing roles. And it's the production types, usually, that are the players who are manipulating other people to get what they want. And while they are manipulating them, they love them dearly. And the moment they got what they want, they don't exist anymore. This other person doesn't exist anymore. Players only love you when they're playing. So, wow, how we use this word, play, right? A lot of it I don't like. <laughs> if I'm playing to win, or you got to play the hand God dealt you, really? <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> maybe I can take a look at this hand and see what part I had and maybe it coming my way, <laughs> and perhaps there is a room for a little creativity in this. Oh, play, creativity, play, creativity. That's what we lose when we don't allow child play. Creativity is a huge part of child play. Huge. And each of these other stages have taught us not to be creative. Oh dear. So, if you are being asked, what do you do for fun? <laughs> and nothing comes to mind, I strongly recommend, what are you being creative at? For me, it's generally making places beautiful. Sometimes it's writing books or editing and formatting books. 
sometimes. It's hanging out with really wonderful people and being in that dialogue space where we are creating something that didn't exist before. Yeah. That requires a little bit of risk. You can't play it safe and be creative. One of the things that goes on in my daughter's house where the kids are growing up is when mom isn't home, meals are held in a way that the kids watch TV while they're eating. When mom's home, we all sit at the table. But when she's not there, dad sets the kids at the kitchen counter and they get to watch TV. And the favorite show of the nine-year-old boy is something called Cutthroat Kitchen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who have been watching the Food Network for any amount of time may recall Alton Brown had a series called Good Eats. Yes. That was fabulous. Yes. This, yeah, he called it the combination of Julia Child, Mr. Wizard, and Sesame Street. <laughs> I thought it was marvelous, and my whole family loves it. Well, this is Alton Brown bringing in the Sesame Street stuff and a little bit of CIS <laughs> and having three cooks, unfortunately, having to win. So there's a real performance pressure and, and my nine-year-old grandson likes that. But what he really likes is watching Alton Brown come in with horrible things that these cooks can do to each other to make it almost impossible to fulfill the assignment of preparing the food that is there. And the nine-year-old just loves this. And one episode was the Halloween episode. Alton Brown comes in dressed like Dracula. And at one point, one of the cooks is required to cook from inside Dracula's coffin. And then someone manages, there's, there's a thing where they're all handed a certain amount of money and then they use that money to buy things through an auction that then they lay on each other. So they're more likely to win if the other guy has these handicaps, okay? <clears throat> so one of the things on that episode was that um, Alton Brown came out with these two containers. One was a jar of little brown things and the other one was a bowl of brains. And the little brown things were crickets. And the chef had to make a stew and was not allowed to have any other protein, only these proteins. And my nine-year-old looks at that, at that and you know, they're going through and, and uh, observing what these guys are doing. And this guy's putting the whole crickets in his stew. And they're going, no, 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 you don't do that. When you got crickets, you got to ground them up in the powder. That's what the kids are saying. The nine and twelve-year-old. No, no, when you get crickets, you have to grind them up and turn them into powder. Then you can use them. <laughs> I told that to a friend of mine, and he said, oh, you mean it's already happening. The kids already know what they're going to have to do in 50 years or 100 years. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting thing. But that told me a lot about how much these kids have been watching the show. But it, the other piece of it, and this was actually part of the inspiration for the write-up for this talk, was one of the guys on that show was handed the money that he was supposed to use to buy things to keep other people from being able to compete. And he said, uh-uh, I'm leaving, I'm leaving with this whole amount of money, I'm not buying anything. Uh-oh. Because that meant that someone else was going to be doing things to him. The whole point of the money was if you got this, you weren't going to be, you know, if you got, if, if you, if this thing came out and you bought it, someone else would have to deal with it, you wouldn't have to deal with it. Okay? So this poor guy got it slammed over and over again because he would never buy the awful things, the cutthroat things that go on in cutthroat kitchen. He was playing it safe. He was just going to do what he knew how to do with all the tools and the foods that he had in front of him. He wasn't going to have to be creative with these weird things that were done to him. So it was not play for him. Now everyone there 
was feeling the performance pressure. I want to leave with the money. I want to be the winner. But there was an element of playfulness, both in Alton Brown, who is always playful, even when he's doing these horrible things to contestants, and these other folks. And that playfulness came out of their going, wow, what am I going to do with this? Oh, I've got this idea. I could do this. Yeah. And then they do their best to create something that's really wonderful out of what could be word situations. I think it was IBM that invented the phrase, when you're handed lemons, make lemonade. Yeah? And I think that's part of what they're talking about. IBM was a very creative place at that time. <laughs> it wasn't stodgy yet. When we play it safe, we are no longer playing. When we play to win, we could be playing if we bring our creativity in. But if we play only for the winning, we're not playing anymore. We're doing something else entirely. One of my clients says, my pusher driver striver is in gear. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's not playing. So I invite everyone here to think about what's happening. You know, you're not in cutthroat kitchen. You're not going to be handed crickets to eat, probably not in the near future. But something is going to be handed to us. This last year, it was, oh, stay home. Don't go around. Don't talk to anyone. Go, don't visit anyone and don't go out shopping. And a lot of people got really creative. A lot, you know, I happened to decide I wanted some marigolds for my garden and I went to a couple of places and all the marigolds were gone because everyone had started gardens this year, or last year, last spring. Those kinds of things. People started getting really creative. I saw more quilts last year and more knitted hats in the last year and all kinds of interesting strange things and more YouTube videos and I am fairly convinced that a lot of people who are not going back to their low paying jobs used the year to create other forms of income. A lot of them. Because they want more play in their lives. We all deserve more play in our lives. So take a look. Maybe every day. How am I going to play today? Is it woven into my living? Or am I going to set aside some time just for playing because this is work and that's no fun? Or am I going to go, ooh, how can I make work fun? Yeah. Play. It's a good thing. And we don't have to play it safe. We want to play it creative. Thank you all very much. Play, play, play. I don't have to tell Sally to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So play is interesting. You know, I think about myself. Um, I play every morning when I spend, oh, maybe an hour doing my Sudoku puzzles. I mean, that's relaxation, but it's play. It's uh, it's a, how do, you, how do you fill in the puzzles? Do you do each square? Do you do each column or each row first? Or do you do a combination? It's play. It's fun. And it's, it's absolutely exhilarating. So thank you. I had a, one good takeaway is you can't play it safe and be creative. You can't do both. And yet, and yet <laughs> I offer one observation. Having watched the, the college softball championships, the ladies, oh my gosh, are they creative. And sometimes when you play it safe, you are actually playing the game and having fun playing safe. Um, you and you got to get, and you have to get creative about how to be safe. Okay. okay? Um, so there's just thank you. That's a good way to to weave in and think about all the different kinds of play. Is it an adjective? Is it a noun? Is it a pronoun? Is it a verb? What is it? So um, thank you. Is my new four letter word. <laughs> play. <laughs> I know I So we are drawing to the end of our fiscal year, uh, June 30th, and we invite all who have not yet fulfilled your pledge payments to send those in to us. We sure could use those to finish out the year. And uh, also know that we start a new fiscal year July 1st. And next year we have a budget of $58,000, 
and we hope to make good use of that money for our future as we go forward. Our community partner is also looking to us for financial contributions. And we finish up this month with our partner, the uh, Friends of Florence Van Fans. The fa fans of the van, shall we say. And the money you provide to them and that we pass along goes to, I imagine, purchasing gas, maintenance, oil, whatever it needs for that van. Nobody pays to ride this van to go back and forth to Eugene for their cancer treatment. <coughs> run by volunteers, one or two of which, uh, of whom uh, come to FOOF. So, you know, this really is very helpful. And I'm pleased to say that this particular organization was also selected for next year's offering. So we'll be doing this again in a year. Okay, so this, if you'd like to make a contribution, payment here to FOOF or to uh, the Friends of Florence Cancer Van, you can send that to us at FOOF, P.O. Box 2502. 97439, or you can go onto our website, uh, florence.uuf.com, and click on the donate button. We'll make sure we take care of that distribution for you, okay? So as we move forward with this offering, I ask you here and you at home, if you'd like to repeat after me, divine love through me. Divine love through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. All that I, all that I give. All, all that, that I give. give. And all that I receive. And all that I receive. I am prosperous now. I am prosperous now. I said I am prosperous now. I am prosperous now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Blessed be. Blessed be. Blessed be. <laughs> I invite Raymond to come up. We're going to extinguish our flame here at FOOF, if you'd like to extinguish your flame at home, with these words called Blessed by Our Connections by Susan Carlson. We leave, we leave blessed by our connections to one another, to the spirit of life. Walk lightly that you see the life that is below your feet. Spread your arms as if you had wings and could dance through the air. Feel the joy of your breath in your lungs and the fire in your heart. Live to love and be a blessing on this earth. I leave, before, we, before we do the peace song, I'd like to offer you um, a brief closing words. This comes from Betz Winnecke. May we leave this place seeking an unchartered and freely chosen way to wholeness, knowing we have companions along the way. That, I think, summarizes FOOF better than I can think of today. You have connections. We are connected. We are walking together. We will get through this. We will be coming back live in person. We will be practicing safety measures. Uh, we welcome everybody to the extent we have room to come join us. Again, we're going to open softly with maybe 35, maybe 40 chairs, um, and we're gonna work on all the details as we go forward from that. Because remember, we're still kind of, maybe soon to be under construction. <laughs> so we're not gonna open 77 chairs and then have to close down the next week. So anyway, I've said enough. I want to bring two of you back up here and I invite anybody else to stand in your place that you were earlier and, and let's sing our peace song, shall we? Do you need to be back here? I wanna be back there, yes. Oh, okay, then move out of the way so I can get out. <laughs> so do be up. Bring it on, baby. Peace song. I just wanted to say that uh, Anne and Dave, I know how much you love this song. Yes. We're going to sing this for you and send you blessings and healing. Yes. Right. 